Okay. All right. So how about now? Another name for linear programming is, can y'all see that one? Yeah. Okay. So I just told you on the introduction what the answer was. What's another name for linear programming? Like profit minimization. So A is the goal. We are either trying to maximize your profit or oh, minimize your cost. There you go. It's constrained optimization, right? Constrained optimization. So you're trying to either maximize your profit or you're trying to minimize your cost subject to certain constraints, right? The interior point method is another method that we use that's nonlinear. So we'll talk about that down the road too. All right. So what would you think is the first step in solving your problem? I, I, I Identify. Identify and define, exactly. Identifying and defining the problem is the first step, okay? Then you determine the alternatives, evaluate the results, and choose an alternative, okay? All right. So this one's kind of hard. Think it through, all right? Linear. There you go. This is a linear function, right? Linear functions are those where the variables appear in a separate term, each one of them is raised to the first power, right? So there's straight lines, basically. Got it? All right, one more. The part of the linear programming model that you're seeking to minimize or maximize is called the, probably don't know this one, right? Anybody want to take it? The linear constraints. No, nope. the, the linear constraints are the things that get in your way. So this is actually called the objective function, right? The objective function. So the objective function is that thing that you're trying to maximize or minimize. You're either maximizing profits or minimizing costs, you know, maximizing output, minimizing whatever, right? Okay. okay. Now. Now, keep in mind, in linear programming, you can either be maximizing or minimizing. So what would you think this one would be? Optimal. Optimal solution, exactly. So the optimal solution is both is either the max or the min, depending on which one you're trying to do, right? Oh, now, come on, so you made that up. <laughs> there you go, right? Okay. So let's take a look. Now, linear programming started back during uh, the Second World War. And the idea was is that the folks who were trying to defeat uh, the Nazis were looking at a way to move the materials as cheaply as possible, to get as much as they could, as quickly as they could. And so one of the things they would do is they'd look at what's the cargo hold? How do we, uh, uh, what's the weight capacity of the ship? How do we pull all of that together? And so, for instance, one of the things that they would do is they figured out that instead of assembling a Jeep in the factory and shipping it across the way, they could put the entire thing together, put the tires, take the tires off of it, take certain pieces off of it and put it into a crate. And it would only take be the same weight, but only take half the space. And so then they would put together a manual to tell the field technicians how to put them together in the field, okay? So they would ship an unassembled Jeep and tell them how to put it together in the field. And that worked for certain things, other things not so much, because like in addition to that, they would also ship ammunition in the crate in any of the spaces that they could find, right? So they would uh, move that across and make sure that they understood how to develop that even better. Now. Linear programming has nothing to do with a computer program because a program is just a course of action. It's like, think of it like an algorithm, if you will. Okay. So it just wants us to choose a course of action when the mathematical model tells us that this is the right way to go. And it's called linear because they're only linear functions. Okay. All right. Now, 
the objective and the constraints are linear. And so therefore it's referred to as a linear function. So let's do some definitions, right? And these are important for you to know. The linear function are those functions where the variables appear in a separate term raised to the first power, and then it's multiplied by a constant. And that constant could be zero, right? So I'll get to that in just a moment. Linear constraints are also linear functions, but they are not, um, they are not equations, they're inequalities. So for instance, it'll have a less than or a greater than or so on and so forth, okay? Now, the goal is to maximize or minimize some quantity. The goal is to maximize or minimize some quantity. And all of the constraints have a limited amount of pull on each one of the pieces, right? And so those constraints will also limit the degree to which the objective can be pursued. So for instance, you say, I wanna maximize my profit or I wanna maximize the amount of money that I make from my job, but you're subject to constraints. You're subject to the amount of work that they'll allow you to do. How many hours can you work in a week? What other things do you have to do, right? So you wanna minimize the time it takes for you to get from Boca Raton to Orlando. So you're, min you're constrained by speed limit. You're constrained by road conditions. You're constrained by, you know, whether or not you took your wife and she has to pee every five minutes. Sorry about that, right? Okay, so a feasible solution satisfies all the problems constraints. It's one that all of the constraints are done. It does not necessarily have to be the optimal solution. A feasible solution satisfies all the constraints but the optimal solution goes one step further and it gives you the largest possible objective function or smallest when minimizing. So the optimal solution is the best solution. A feasible solution is one, okay, we can get it done, but the optimal solution is one where we have to think about it, right? Okay, this is done, this is it, this is, excuse me, we don't have to think about it. This is the absolute best. And so back in the day before they had computers, they used what was called the graphical method. And that's what I want to present to you today. So let's take a look at this particular one. OK, so you have two uh, pieces of material that you sell. Right. So you have your objective function where it says to maximize 5x1 plus 7x2, where x1 and x2 are the different things that you have available to you. So for instance, X1 might be, um, you have, you know, you're, you're a kiosk in the middle of the mall and you're selling um, iPhone and Samsung Galaxy cases, okay? So X1 might be the number of iPhone cases that you have. X2 might be your Samsung Galaxy case. So you make $5 off of the iPhone, $7 off of Samsung Galaxy. The next thing where it says ST, that means subject to. And so it's subject to these constraints. X1 less than or equal to six. You can't sell more than six because you only have six iPhone cases. Make sense? Okay. The next thing, 2X1 plus 3X2 less than or equal to 18 might be the physical space that it takes up, all right? So for instance, it might be that um, the iPhone takes up two square inches, the Samsung Galaxy takes up three square inches, and you only have 18 square inches of counter space that you can use to display, right? The last one, X1 plus X2 less than or equal to eight, maybe this is how much each one of them costs you, right? So you have eight bucks that you can use to spend on this. So X1 plus X2, uh, the number that you have here is eight, okay? So let's go back. I meant to mention one other thing to you here. The last thing is this idea of the non-negative constraints. You cannot have negative numbers, all right? So with that in mind, what's the objective function? Which one of these is the objective function? The max. There you go. A is the objective function. This is the thing that we're trying to take a look at, 
right? This is what we want to do. We want to maximize our profit subject to these constraints. All right. What's the non-negative constraints? Yeah, subject to. Okay, but which ones? There's four of them there. Non-negative is um. Is it D? D. Yes. Yes. X1 and X2 have to be greater than zero, so those are called non-negative constraints. Right? Okay. So which one tells us the maximum number of X1 units we can make? X1 less than... There you go. So B. Six, yeah. All right, there you go. All right. Okay, so let's take a look at this profit maximization problem, right? Again, this is the objective function. These are the regular constraints, and these are the non-negative constraints, right? So the max whatever is the objective function, okay? So now I want to take that same equation, and I want to present it in a graphical form to you, all right? So let's take a look at this particular one. We have X1 across the bottom on the, quote, X axis. We have X2 on the vertical axis, okay? So the first thing we look at is the constraint. So the first constraint we had was telling me that X1 had to be less than or equal to six. It didn't say that there was any other thing. So X1, we simply put a vertical line there at six comma zero. So X1 equals six, and we know that all of the shaded region is all of the feasible points for that constraint. Anywhere where X1 is less than or equal to six gives us a feasible point for that constraint. So far, so good? Mm -hmm. Okay. So now let's add another one, okay? The next one is the equation 2X1 plus 3X2 equals 18. Well, we know that one of the ways we can do this is we can look at what if we set the first equal to zero? That So x1 equals zero fits and satisfies the first constraint, right? And if that's the case, then our next function is going to be, so if this was a zero, right, we put the dot here, because we have x1 and x2, 0, 6, right? Three, at, 3 times 6 equals 18, so we've satisfied that end of the constraint. On the other end, we look and we say, okay, what if we did it the absolute opposite way? If we set x2 equal to 0, then our equation would be 2 times 9 equals 18, so we end up with 9.0. So we've got 0 0.6 on the x2 axis and 9 comma 0 on the x1 axis. And when we graph that, we end up with this graph. So the graph of the line that represents 2x1 plus 3x2 equals 18 is given here. And then all of the shaded region underneath actually gives us the feasible region for that. So now, if you think x1 equals 6 gives us everything that's in blue, 2x1 plus 3x2 equals 18 gives us everything in red. So we have now constrained our feasible region. All right. Anybody have a question? We good? Okay. All right. So now let's take a look at the third constraint x1 plus x2 equals 8. So to solve it for x2, we're going to set x1 equal to 0. And by the way, notice that the coefficient is understood to be 1 here. Okay, so 1 times x1, you get that, right? So and then 1 by 8 gives us this end. And then the other direction gives us that end. And so the green now comes straight through the middle at the same point, okay? So far, so good? Yep. All right. 
And then when we shade into that region, we get this area here. Okay. All right. And so then the feasible region becomes the area that's shaded in orange, right? We have X one less than or equal to six, right? And then we have two X one plus three X two less than or equal to 18. X one plus X two less than or equal to eight. So when we put all of that together, we get the orange feasible region. And any point inside or tangent to that feasible, feasible region will give us a feasible solution. But the question then becomes, is it the best solution, right? Is it the best solution? And so then we take a look at our profit maximizing function, max of 5x plus 7x2, right? So we look at each of these coefficients, the five and the seven, and we figure, okay, five times seven equals 35. Right. So if X one was one and X two was one, we could figure that out relatively easily. Right. And so what we want to do is we say if five times seven equals thirty five, then we figure the best that we could probably do would be to come up with maybe say, let's try at thirty five bucks. OK, now we're going to adjust this in just a moment. So you'll see how it works. All right, so 5x1 plus 7x2 equals 35. We do it the same way as we did the others. We set x1 equal to zero, therefore x2 equals five, okay? And we would set x2 equal to zero so that x1 becomes seven. So we have the coordinates zero, five, and seven, zero to work with, okay? And so that gives us a line that comes here. Now, on that line, anywhere along that line inside the feasible region would be a solution, but it is not the optimal solution. And so what we do is we shift that line outward until it only touches on the maximized point. And so that maximized point equals X1 equals six and X2 equals two. So to maximize our profit on our little kiosk, we should put six iPhone two uh, iPhone 10 cases and two Samsung Galaxy cases, okay? So that's how you would do this if it was the linear function or if we were doing it using straight lines in the graphical method, you got it? I'm gonna teach you how to do this in Excel as well. But I wanted to go over this with you and I wanted to make sure everybody else understood it who's not uh, able to be with us today, okay? So this is where our optimal solution ends. Now, let's take a look at the next one and see if you can figure this one out. So we're gonna make six of the X1s, two of the X2s. Six X1s, two of the X2s. So my question to you is, if we follow this pattern, how much profit will we make? Is it X2 is six? Is X2 is two? Yes. Oh, yeah, right. 44. So that's where we are. Okay, so here's the equation. Six X1s, two X2s. Forty-four dollars. That's correct, right? So you're gonna make 44 bucks. So here's how Uloma got that, right? So five times six plus seven times two, five by six is 30, seven by two is 14, 30 plus, right? It's gonna give us our profit. So by the way, pi means profit, okay? Five by six plus seven by two equals our profit. So 30 plus 14 is 44, and therefore you got it right. Good job, Uloma, okay? Mm -hmm. All right, now, so, Let's talk about this concept of what's called extreme points, all right? So the extreme points are the corners or the vertices of the feasible region, right? The, they are the corners or the vertices of the feasible region. And the optimal solution when you're doing it graphically is always gonna be found at the extreme points of the feasible region, okay? 
always going to be found at the extreme points of the feasible region. Now, when you're looking for the optimal solution, you don't have to evaluate everything that's in the orange part of the graph. You just look at the three points of the feasible region, okay? With that in mind, that gives us this idea of being able to pull together a spreadsheet solution. And so because we know that that's how it works, Excel has a function built in called the solver function, okay? It has a function built in called the solver function. So in this regard, we have our X1 and X2 variables. This is the left-hand side of the equation. So these become the coefficients. Then you have your constraints, all right? So in constraint one, we said that X1 had to be less than or equal to six. So there is nothing to do with the X2 variable, therefore we're not interested in that. In constraint two, we said 2x1 plus 3x2 had to be less than or equal to 18. And in the third function, we said x1 and x2 have to be less than or equal to 8. And so then we had our objective function coefficients here and here. Okay. All right. So I'm going to help you set this up. We're not going to be able to get to it today because we still have a bit to get through here. But on Wednesday, I'm going to have this set up, I'm gonna have the problem set up for you and we can start moving through to develop our understanding, okay? Now, what I wanna to get to though is making sure we know how to look at each of these cells. This is an output that you would look at uh, once Excel has solved the problem for us, okay? So you have each of your constraints, one, two, and three, here, here, and here. Then you have the left-hand side of the coefficients and your constraints for the profit max function. Notice here that it gives you your objective function as well, okay? So let's talk about each one of these pieces. Let's look at the reduced cost and the shadow price, okay? So the reduced cost is that decision variable where zero is the optimal solution. Let me explain what that means, okay? It is the, in technical terms, it's the amount of the variable's objective function coefficient that would have to improve before it would assume a positive value, okay? In other words, if we're trying to maximize our profit, right now we're good because our reduced cost is zero. That reduced cost being zero means that we don't need extra resources to be able to maximize our profit. Okay, all right. The shadow price is the amount that you would pay for one more unit of that resource. This is the marginal value of one more unit of that resource. So we know, for instance, that if we were selling iPhone cases, we only have six of them to sell. So if we could buy more iPhone cases, we could make more money. But if we paid more than 33 cents for it, we wouldn't be maximizing our profit. Okay. Somebody have a question? Can you repeat that last statement again? Yeah. So uh, in the next slides, I actually have it written out. So let's go that far. Okay. So the reduced cost, right, is the opportunity cost. Okay. okay. Reduced cost meaning zero means you're not leaving money on the table. So think of reduced cost as the opportunity cost. If you have anything greater than zero, that means that you have messed up and you're leaving money on the table and you need to fix that. Okay. All right. The next thing is the shadow price. Okay. This is the maximum you'd be willing to pay for one more unit. This is your marginal utility. Okay. So if the shadow price is zero, that means you aren't willing to pay anything extra because you already have enough of that, right? Adding more to it would not help you. So let's take a look again, right? Our first constraint, right? Let's go back, I'm sorry, right? Our first constraint here, these being all zeros mean that's good. It means we have absolutely maximized our potential. 
right? Okay, so we haven't gone any further. We, we can't make any more money off of it. We could make more money off of it if we had additional resources. And so for resource number one, we would be willing to pay 33 cents extra. Okay. In other words, if we had more iPhone cases, we could make more money. And therefore, we could be willing to pay 33 cents extra for those. On the next one, this is the counter space we have available. What we really need is a bigger kiosk. And we would be willing to pay an extra $2.33 for one extra square foot of that particular um, resource. Okay. So far, so good. All right. What we do not need is more time in the day because that shadow price is zero. Okay. All right. So putting all of that together, I ask you, what is the reduced cost for X1? Okay. So what is the reduced cost for X1? Let's go back and take a look. All right. You look at the reduced cost. Okay. And if the reduced cost here is zero and zero, I'm asking you, what is the reduced cost for X1, which is the iPhone cases? Zero. Right, so it should be zero, right? Yeah. Okay, now you are correct on that. So ignore the fact that I have the red dot here because it is actually zero. Okay, good job on that. What is the shadow price for constraint number two? Let's go back and take a look. Two dollars. Right, constraint two. So what's the shadow price for that? $2.33. There you go. $2.33. Okay. Good job. All right. Now, let's talk about this idea of the feasible region, right? So, the feasible region is usually going to be a polygon, all right? But it could be non existent. You can have no feasible solution. Like you just can't get the job done with the constraints you have. It could be a single point. You only optimize at this point, no further. Okay. It could be a line or a polygon, or even it could be an unbounded area, right? So with that in mind, linear programming falls into four categories. Feasible, oh, excuse me, infeasible, unique optimal solution, alternative solutions, unbounded, right? Your objective function can be increased without bound, right? Okay. So... The feasible region being unbounded and still have an optimal solution is kind of counterintuitive, so, right? Okay, so usually this is when you have a minimization problem. If you produce, it's unbounded, right? Yet you still have that, like, like if you don't produce anything, right? Then you're gonna minimize your cost for sure. But not producing anything is not a, uh, not producing, like producing zero would be the optimal solution. You can't produce negative results. So that's what we're getting at there. So sometimes you have more than one optimal solution, right? And you have to think through the process to figure out which ones they are. And so here's what we're looking at with that. Notice that the uh, boundary constraint for 2x1 uh, plus 3x2 equals 18, which is this line, okay, together with the profit max function of 4x1 plus 6x are parallel lines, right? So every point from A to B is an optimal solution. Any of those along that point would produce maximum profitability for you, okay? All right, so let's look at the idea of infeasibility, right? Infeasibility, you just can't find a solution. So there is no feasible region that exists, and why is that? The first thing you wanna do, the first thing you wanna do is go back and check your math. Maybe you put in the wrong answer, maybe you put in the wrong number, so on and so forth. Also, it may be that management's expectations are too high. We wanna maximize the profit on this, but there's 
not a lot of meat left on the bone. There's not a lot of profit to be made. So, right. And then maybe there's a, a situation where there's too many restrictions placed on the problem, like you over constrained. Okay. So let's take a look at this next one. There are no points that satisfy both constraints, right? So we have 2x1 plus x2 has to be greater than 8, so it has to go out to the right greater than 8, and simultaneously less than 12. Well, this region and this region have no areas that overlap, right? So you can't be in the blue shaded region here and here at the same time. There are no points that overlap, and as a result, this is an infeasible solution, okay? So let's take a look at this unbounded part. So unbounded just simply means that it goes on indefinitely without violating any of the other constraints, right? So to be honest with you, um, this is usually because you don't have proper formulization. In, in theory, you can have this right? But in the real world, you can't. So for instance, let's say we were looking at that problem where we were maximizing the number of iPhone cases, right? So we said X less than or equal to six. And we said that, that as long as we're within that bound, we're good. Well, what if we said we have to sell, you know, um, so we're saying we're, we know that we could make more money if we had more iPhone cases. So let's just produce more iPhone cases. And so the next day you come up, you've got a truckload of iPhone cases, but you haven't taken into account the size of your kiosk or your storage or any of those other things. So that then becomes an issue as well, okay? So usually if you have an unbounded solution, it's because you've probably forgotten a constraint, all right? Okay, so with that in mind, I'm gonna end now. I'm going to ask, do you have any questions? I'll be more than glad to go back to a slide if you want. Um, and so what we're looking at here was just a, a situation where we, you know, I wanted to be able to present the materials to you. And I will show you on Wednesday and record that session as well, how we actually pull it all together in Excel. Okay. So. Um, over the next few, do you have any questions, comments, concerns? Good morning, Jordan. Right. Johan, I didn't see you guys come in. Right. Andy, you have a question? I actually answered one of your questions, but that's I it. saw that. I saw that. So all right. So I didn't I didn't hear you, I guess, over the rest of the voices. Good job on that. All right. Anya, did you have a question? Loma, did you have a question? No. Okay. All right, just asking. Do we have any other questions, right, about this particular thing? Okay. So if we don't,